praise the Lord. I don't know what that was over here, but that wasn't Shabbat Shalom. <laughs> My goodness. Okay, we are in week five. Bless you. Week five of our series on Hebrews. And today, man, what I love, and I say this every once in a while, you know, this is really a tribute to, to our worship leader, Steve, because when you're getting, you're preparing this message, like he doesn't get my notes or know what I'm speaking on until like yesterday about two o'clock, right? Two, two, three. When I get everything done, I send it out to, uh, to all of those that are, you know, that's pertinent to. And so some of this music that we were playing this morning and we were singing, it just, it fits so well to today's message. When you start thinking about things like the name of Yeshua, the name of Jesus, and the power of that name and what it holds. And so today we're kind of kind of venturing into that as we step into uh, continuing Hebrews chapter 2. If you uh, are new here today and or new online, you're just now joining us. Can I get the, the passages up there on the, on the back screen, please? Um, if you're new, we've been walking, we're walking through the book of Hebrews. This is going to be a, uh, uh, quite an adventure. Uh, we're only on week five of probably um, 60 plus weeks of this message. And we'll take some breaks in between. We've already got some things that are planned um, coming up here uh, in January and in December. Uh, so, but this is really a good study because, you know, we've been looking at several things. Thank you. Uh, we've been looking at several, several things, several important things when it comes to this book. Number one, we're realizing just how this book has kind of been misinterpreted, right? And, and some of the things that we use at it. We've discovered who the book is written to. We've discovered that this is written to the Jewish people. And it's written by, at least we do not know the author, but we know that it's written by uh, a, a Jewish author. So we know some believe it was Luke, some believe it was Paul, some believe Barnabas. Some even believe that Timothy wrote it. There is a lot of speculation of who wrote this book. The, but, the, but the one thing that is not speculation is that it was written by a Jewish person. And you might be sitting there going, well, I'm not Jewish. How in the world does this thing apply to me? Very easily because of the reason why this book was written. And it was written for the very fact that there were Christian, Messianic believers, Jewish believers, who had come to faith in Messiah, and now they were drifting. They were drifting back to the traditions. They wanted to do the sacrifices. They wanted to develop the temple. They wanted to do all this stuff. And so the author writes and says, whoa, 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 what are you doing? Like you're trying to do works again? What are you, what's wrong with you? Right? And we talk about that how even in our faith as, as people who have come to the understanding of Torah and, and we're learning that the whole Bible is relevant for today from Genesis to Revelation, that once we come, we come in by grace, we love Messiah, we realize we're sinners, we realize that we need a Savior, we realize that Jesus is that answer. And then we come to Torah. And we get this amazing truth. And we begin to drift. And we get to drift into the, 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 the traditions of the rabbis, the traditions of the Pharisees. And we think those things become more important. And it doesn't mean that those things are not important. They are. I think they are important. That we should walk in our testimony of Messiah is by the way we walk out righteousness. I believe that 100%. But I don't believe that those things that we're walking out are the things that will save us. We're saved by grace through faith in Messiah Yeshua. And so that's the letter. And so you look at that and you understand the context. What happens is we go, wait a minute, maybe this really does apply to me today. Maybe this really does have something to do with the way I live and move and have my being in Christ. And so we're going to finish that. So we've been establishing this whole foundation over the last four weeks and I love what this goes, because we, we kind of hit it at this. We hinted at what we're going to talk about today a couple of weeks ago. And, man, this is like you can't make this stuff up. Like when you understand our position in Messiah, listen, when you understand, I want you to get this this morning because this is paramount. When you understand who you are and your position in Christ it will change your life. And I'm telling you, man, some of you, are, you came here today, I believe this, to hear this message. This is probably going to be, of five weeks so far, I believe this one is going to be, uh, and I hope I don't, I'm not overselling it, because it's just, it really blessed me as I was writing it. So we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna take a look 
um, and a very unique statement or unique statements within the scriptures. And we're going to talk a little bit about this world that's going to come. I was a little hesitant in tackling this because of the subject matter. However, I do believe that it is relevant for us today if we take this thing in context. Because I think there's a, there's a truth that exists among believers in Messiah that certain sects of Christianity has perverted. And I want to bring that back into our realm of the Torah and how it applies today. So over the past month, we have covered much ground dealing with who the Messiah is. We've dealt with his authority. The author conveys and really comes against a lot of this fake or false rabbinic teaching and Jewish thought. We talked about angels and, and how their view is on angels and what's the influence of angels in the outfield. We're going to continue with that today. And he continues down this vein, as, and as always, it applies to us as the followers of Messiah. And this is what I love about Scripture. And one of the things that I try to do is to bring, even from the, in from the, uh, from the Tanakh or the Old Testament, I love to bring r- r- the truth to it and show how we use this today. And I believe this is going to be one of those, one of those passages. So we're going to kick right off in the book of Hebrews, chapter 2, beginning in verse 5. And this is what it says. It's for, for it is not to angels... The Elohim, or God, has subjected the Olam Haba, that is, the world to come. As a matter of fact, when you study this word, Olam Haba, it literally means a populated world, a world a little different than the world that we're living today, maybe, because it's the world to come. It's the world to come. But watch. So he says that he's got a much subject on this, about which we speak, but somewhere, someone, I love this, has testified saying, what is man? What is man that you're mindful of him or the son of man that you care for him? Now, this is a great scripture. And the reason why this is a great scripture, because he's coming out of, I love what the, the there's two things I want us to point out. Number one is that he's quoting a, a, a passage within the Tanakh, the Old Testament, but he's not, he doesn't care about the author. It's the point in which he's making And that's what he wants you to be aware of. He wants you to, the author's like making a huge statement here. And if you're not studying scripture, you're not kind of really, you know, picking this stuff out, you'll miss this. And this is powerful. It's a great passage. It's a passage that we're going to really unpack this morning. Because remember in our last message, in in last week, we ended up talking about the evidence of Messiah that was given through the signs and wonders. Remember, you go back to the uh, verse 4, I believe it's verse 3 and 4, and you see that the evidence that was proven that Jesus was the Messiah was in the signs and wonders that he performed. And now he's going to shift these gears a little bit, and he's going to point us not from the reality of the here and now, but in the reality of the things to come. This is powerful. Remember the writer's first argument way back in chapter 1, 1 through about 14, was to show the superiority of the Son to the angels in his deity. We dealt with this in the first couple of weeks. We dealt with the deity of Messiah. And what we believe as a community is that Yeshua is God in the flesh. And we see Hebrews in chapter 1, this is what the argument is. He proves the deity of Yeshua. Here, we're going to look at the other side of the coin and show that even in his humanity, in some way, he's still superior to the angels, even in his human form. And in 114, he shows that the angels are, and we have to, we, this has got to be super important that we remember this, that the angels are classified as servants. And why is that important? It means that if they're servants, they can't be rulers. So the angels aren't going to rule. Now in verse 2, or chapter 2, verse 5, the writer's going to point out that no angel did he ever give authority for the world to come. And I want us to get this this morning. We are going to talk about a couple of different things. Really, it's going to be kind of flipping back and forth. But number one, we're going to talk about the authority of Messiah again. But I want to talk about that in perspective of how that authority now applies to us as followers of Messiah, for those who are living the life they were created to live, for those who've accepted Messiah, who've repented of sin, 
For those who've been transformed, you've been transformed from this kind of earth, earthly mindset almost into more of a supernatural or spiritual mindset. It's powerful. The Greek word here, this uh, alam haba, is the word inhabited world. And to no angel did he give the inhabited world. And in this case, it is the world to come. What many may believe as the millennium or the kingdom here on earth. However you want to kind of uh, imagine that for a moment. The kingdom or the messianic age. A lot of times when we talk about the world to come, it is the messianic age. And if it is the messianic age, here's the thought. Could we be living in a messianic age even now? Some believe that we are. And it's just the world to come that's going to usher in everything else in the end time. Now, by saying the world to come, the author uses the most common rabbi, uh, rabbinic term uh, for the messianic kingdom. In other words, the messianic kingdom will not be ruled by an angel. That's important. Then you've got to ask, well, who's it going to be ruled by? Right? God did not give the authority of the earth. This is huge. I'm not going to go into this. I thought about it. I told Robin, I said, man, I think I'm going to talk about this. And then the Lord's like, strip that idea. And he does that. But I want you to hear this statement. Some of you are going to understand what I'm about to say. God did not give the authority of the earth over to any angel. Any. Either in the present or in the future. So for those of you, I am going to, no, yes, I'm going to make the statement. Listen. I know there's kind of this thing out there about the, uh, what is it called? The Nephilim. Oh. In case you haven't read your Bible, they were destroyed. They're not coming back to rule. In fact, the rulership of the world was given over to man until they did something very foolish. Until they handed it over to those fallen angels, namely Hasatan or Satan in the Garden of Eden. Now, the statement that he uses, somewhere, someone has testified. This is a Greek idiom. Remember, we talked about Hebrew idiom. This is a Greek idiom, which is kind of like, for those of you who know, what's an idiom? Um, it's, like, it's like when I tell you and I say something like, you know, um, poor Steve, kick the can. Now, most of us in America know that he's not out in the middle of the highway somewhere kicking a can. We know that we'll probably have a service somewhere where we're going to weep and cry and sing and whatever. I don't know. Maybe he'll have hair then. Maybe he won't. I don't know. But it's a, we know that it means that he's passed away, right? When we hear the word kick the can, that's a, an English idiom. Well, in Greek and Hebrew, they have these same, these same type of uh, uh, phrases. And so this Greek idiom, and the original readers would have understood it, that the writer was referring to the word of Elohim, the word of God. For the writer, the exact location and the author were not important in order to make the point that he is going to make. But we're going to look at this passage anyway. I want to go back and at least look at it so you can see what the, what the author is communicating. So he's, he's coming right out of Psalms 8 and 1. Did I lose that, that, that screen? I think I lost the whole back screen. So I'm going to have to look at it from over here. Verse 8 of uh, Psalms, uh, Psalms 8, verse 1 says, Yahweh, our Lord, how excellent is your name over all the earth. You set your splendor above the heavens. And out of the mouths of babes and toddlers, you establish power because of your enemies to silence the foe of the adventure. The adventure, pardon me. Now, this is really interesting. You're going to see a little bit of Hebrewic writing styles that uh, I find very fascinating. And it's the way they place words or phrases or typically write something out. Now, what I want to do is I want to establish, as we, as we develop this, I want to establish Yahweh's position and power, and it's going to take, uh, set the stage for what we're going to talk about. So there's two things you see. You see the movement on how the author's writing. How does he start the phrase off? He starts talking about Yahweh's praise. He praises Yahweh. And I, I like to do stuff like when I'm correcting someone or I have to correct someone, I kind of like to do like how this author is doing it. And that is, I, I, I tell our leaders, like, it's got to be like an Oreo cookie. Like, I like Oreo cookies, if you can't tell. Okay, I do. I love Oreo cookies. And the one thing, everybody has a different way of eating an Oreo cookie. But that's really regardless of this message, praise God. Okay. But it's got a crunchy side. It's got the creamy filling, the sweet side that everybody loves to, right? And then you got the crunchy side again, right? Some people like to just pull off the crunchy part, dip it in the milk, right? Come on, some of y'all. And, and lick the, you know, get the, get the stuff out. I don't know how you do it. 
But that's kind of what the author does, is he's going to bring a statement, and then he's going to say something, and then he ends it with the same type of a statement. And you're going to see that here in just a moment. So, in, so he, he kind of sets us up. The Lord, let's look at that again. I want to just want to look at it for, for reference sake. Adonai, our Elohim, our Yahweh, how excellent is your name. We're going to praise him. We just did that this morning over all the earth. You set your splendor above the heavens and out of the mouths of babes and toddlers. What is he establishing? He's establishing authority. He's establishing who he is, who Yahweh is. And that's what we're doing. He establishes it. This is so important for what he's about to say. Jumping in now to the next verse, verse 8, or chapter 8, verse 4. When I consider your heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have established, what is man that you are mindful of him? What is man that you're mindful of? In other words, I mean, you go outside and you look. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. You look outside and you see every star in the heaven. And you look at it and you know that every star that is there had been placed there by our Elohim, our God. How powerful is that, isn't it? And so he establishes the authority of who Yahweh is. And then he asks him, based on all of this, everything that you have created, what is man? What is man that you're mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet, yet something's happened, yet you made him a little lower than the angels and crowned him with glory and majesty. Like, have you ever thought about, like, look around the room and go, God, what were you thinking? Have you ever thought about that, right? You look around like, ah, but Yahweh says glory and splendor. He does. Glory and splendor. So God creates everything, and then he makes man. And he's asking the question, the psalmist is asking, what, is, what are we that you're mindful of us? Can you, can you just stop there for a moment? Some of you came here just to hear this part. Yahweh is mindful of you. He knows everything about you. He cares about you. And then he goes on to say that he, you made him a little lower than the angels. I want to make sure this is understood, that you, the angels could wipe us out. Like, they have that power. They have that ability. But, and we're going to get into that but here in a minute. This is powerful. Now, the statement that you're seeing being made from the, the beginning of the Psalms and then to this verse 8 is often called a chaotic arrangement, and it's to emphasize the center or the apex of, of the actual conversation, what matters, what matters most. It's not just that Yahweh is Lord and he created everything. It's pointing us to something, and that's the thing in the middle. That's the, the white, the, the, the sugary stuff, the stuff that we like to eat, right, in the cookie, which in this case would be mankind's position in creation, where we stand. And indeed, the psalm centers on the theme, but with an attitude of amazement, that Yahweh, who created all things, would do what? He would entrust his creation to mankind. Now think about that for a moment. Think about that. I loved uh, during the Torah portion, we were talking about uh, uh, Scott bringing a great, great point and said, you know, that, that we're all, he, he separates the thing of the bride. We see Sarah, right? And we see how, you know, Yahweh, she was so perfect and blessed and whatever. And what do we see on the next end? We see we see the woman at the well. And I believe that when he said that, many of us, many of, if not all of us, we can relate to that statement. We can relate to that identity. None in here would say, you know, God gave me, God put me over his creation. I'm over his creation. We miss this. Indeed, the psalm centers on this theme, but with an attitude of amazement. He entrusts his creation to mankind. Moving on in Hebrews 2, 7. For a little while, you made him lower than the angels. Watch. In verses, chapter 2, verse 7, going back. You crowned him with glory and honor. I love that statement. For a little while. In other words, there is a point that something's going to change, isn't there? 
Now, in this world, he made him, man, lower than the angels as a pause. But he says when. If you read Hebrews, it says when? For a little while. For a little while. Now, this gets me thinking. How long is that while, and when does it change? Watch this. Hebrews 8. Let's go in here, and then we're going to really get into the deep stuff. You put all things in subjection under his feet. For when he put all things in subjection to him, he what? He left nothing outside his control. That's deep. Like, you can get lost in this statement right here. You mean God is concerned about you? Yes, he is. But then what does he say? He says, man, what are you, what are you mindful of this guy for or this human that you made lower than the angels? Yet what did you do? You put him in subjection in Hebrews 2, 8, who's continuing on in the book of Psalms. Things in subjection under his feet, and then he left nothing outside his control. Nothing. But for now... We do not yet see all things subjected to him. We're going to come back to that here towards the end of our message. Now, this is so powerful. All things are subjected to him that was established in the creation. And so we're going to dive deep into this, this Shabbat. We're going to dive deep into this thing about spiritual authority. We're going to deal with authority and the authority that we have in Christ. The authority that we have been established that comes from Messiah. So to do that, though, to understand this authority, we have to go way back. And when I say way back, I mean we got to go all the way back to Genesis to understand something very important that you're going to see in Scripture. So I want to go back. I want to kick us off right here in Genesis chapter 1, beginning in verse 8. Watch this. Yahweh blessed them, and Yahweh said to them, or Elohim said to them, be fruitful and multiply. I can preach a message on that in the, in, the, in the area of wedding and, you know, being married. But we're going to move on. And it says, fill the land and do what? Conquer it. So in the, TL, uh, in the TLV version, it says, it used the word, uh, the word conquer it. It says, rule over the fish of the sea, the flying creatures of the sky, and what? Over every animal. Animals were not designed, or, or nor the position of authority was not given to the animals to rule over us. We're to rule over them, and actually uh, over everything, right? Going over into the, I want to look at this, into when we look at the, the Targums, which is just ancient manuscripts, um, you, you see a little something uh, else, a little bit differently, but the same in this passage. I, want to, I wanted to show this to you because I think it, 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 it's prevalent. To our conversation. It says, in the Targum of Onkelos on Genesis, he says, increase and multiply, fill the earth with sons and daughters. Okay. Kind of gives a little bit more light to y'all, right? Praise God. We're going to build our church, right? And prevail over it. Prevail over what? His creation. In its possessions and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the Foul of the heavens. This is so powerful. Oh, I thought I had that highlighted there. And over every creeping animal that creeps upon the earth. See, I, I want you to understand this word, this uh, word prevail or this word conquer that we're using here, it is the word in the Hebrew kabosh. And it means to make subordinate, it means to be dependent. Or subservient. It means to control an environment. And even when you when you hunt down this and you really unpack the deepness of this word kabosh, it even means to have to rule over people. Don't make a mistake here. This is where we're going to hang out this morning. Is that this is all about authority? This is about authority, and it's about authority on this earth. We were given authority. You were given authority. When Adam and Eve were placed in the garden, you have to, we've got to remember this. It was perfect. Now, we, we have a hard time in our finite minds understanding this, but it was without sin. None. Zero. It was the way things were supposed to be. 
It was a taste of the things that we were supposed to be experiencing and living. It was perfect. And they, they communed with Yahweh. Can you imagine literally walking with the Lord? They walked in the, with the Lord in the cool of the day. You know, we can't even try to picture that in our minds and in our thoughts. They had rulership. They had rulership over every being. This was the entire reason that Adam was given the task of naming every living thing. Let me tell you something. For some of you who may not know this, God did not name anybody or anything. He even, Adam, even named his wife. It was Adam that called her, called her Eve. Why is this important? It, it shows us authority. It shows us what Yahweh did. It shows us Yahweh giving authority to mankind, to Adam. Looking at Genesis chapter 2, 19, just for reference, it says, Yahweh Elohim, the Lord our God, had formed from the ground every animal of the field and every flying creature of the sky. Now watch this. So he brought them to the man to see what he would call them. Whatever the man called them, each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all of the livestock and to the flying creatures of the sky and to all the animals of the field. But for the man, he did not find a well-matched helper for him. So two things that we can teach off of this. Number one, the man had a job. Yes, a job. He had responsibility. But then also Yahweh gives him the authority to do what? To name every living creature. And it shows us within Scripture, everything that he called them, each living creature, that was going to be its name. Yahweh never interfered with it. Isn't that awesome? This is Yahweh giving ownership to the man, to Adam. And this is powerful because I want you to think about something. When you think about this authority, let me ask you kind of an off-the-wall question that is related to this. Where is heaven going to be? Come on. I see my brother smiling over there. It's going to be right here. Heaven's going to be here. I had someone in the prison ministry ask me, he's like, you know, if, if we believed in heaven. And, and I said, well, I do and I don't. I mean, I do in a sense of that's where Yahweh resides. But if you're saying, like, do we go to heaven... I don't necessarily agree with that because I believe scripturally we see when someone passes, they go to sleep. And we see in the book of Revelation, we'll probably hit this a couple of times, what do we see? We see heaven and the new Jerusalem coming here. Amen. Powerful. So if we look at Eve and Adam, and we look at the placement of where they were put, it was perfect. It was perfect. We know that a new heaven and a new earth is coming. One that is free from the fall is coming. So think about this, Christian. All right, maybe you online maybe didn't hear this. If everything is going to be perfect when the new heaven and the new earth happen, what makes us think that we can just live any way we want to live? We're in boot camp. We're in training. And we're in training to prepare our life how we're going to live in the new kingdom. Now think about that as we talk about this. This is powerful. How are we going to live? What is it going to be like? Here's the thing. If you do not like authority... You may want to pick your feet up for this one. If you don't like authority, if you don't like spiritual authority, and if you don't like your boss and his authority over your life, you're going you're gonna to be very uncomfortable in the kingdom of Yahweh. Because Yahweh is showing us it's a foreshadow of how things are going to be in the kingdom. Yes, Yeshua will be king and ruler, but he will have kings and priests that will rule over the people. So why not get used to it now? I know a lot of people, and, and I understand the reason behind it. I understand the perversion that has happened in men who've been placed in authority, who've abused that authority. But here again I say, we do not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Get rid of the unhealthy leader and the one that does not know how to operate in healthy spiritual authority. 
and put someone in place that Yahweh has called and that Yahweh places in authority. In this community, we go with an eldership. We have an eldership as our authority. And just like in the book of Ephesians in chapter 5, it says that we're to submit ourselves one to another. That's spiritual authority, church. There is a hierarchy of authority that is coming in the kingdom of Yahweh. You need to know what your position is and how you operate in this kingdom. It doesn't mean we're all going to be like, like we know love, right? I mean, this is going to be what's ruling this kingdom. But I digress. I'm getting a little too far ahead of myself. This is powerful when we understand authority. We will be under the headship of Messiah as he rules this world. But we'll be doing it with him. Why else would our enemy want to pervert Yahweh's creation and the authority given? He understands. We were created, based upon our Hebrew passage and Psalms 8, we were created to rule this world. The question is, what happened? The authority that was given over to the enemy, that's what happened. The authority was given to the enemy. Now, I want you to think about this in light of sin and lawlessness. See, when Yahweh redeemed us, the Bible says we're made new. We're a new creation in Christ Jesus. Behold, all things have become new. And if, if, if Adam and Eve were able to be deceived and take the authority that Yahweh had given them, and rather than walk in obedience... Gave it over to Hasatan. Gave it over to Satan. Bowed to them. Bowed to him, rather. It's powerful. Because now when Messiah comes back on the scene, we see something very, very interesting. Looking at Luke chapter 10, verse 19. He says, Behold, I've given you all authority to trample upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Now, this is just, this is, we're just scraping the surface, right? Because you need to understand your position. Yeah, but Mike, what happened? Yeah, but let's hang on to this for a minute. It's going to get good. It says that you, he's given us all the power of the enemy. I tell people this when we've talked about, like when I do, yes, I believe in deliverance, and, and yes, I believe that someone who has been delivered from a particular thing or an object or demonic spirit or whatever, I do believe in that. I don't believe there's a demon under every bush. I don't believe like, like everything that somebody has going on with them is a demon. You got a headache, oh, it's a demon. Not necessarily. I don't believe every addiction is a demonic spirit. But I do believe that there is demonic warfare. I think it's another, another lie of the enemy, isn't it? That he doesn't exist and that he's not doing anything. But I don't believe all of us. I don't believe all of us are that important where the enemy is like just like, you know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? So I do believe that there's spiritual attack. But we have all authority over it. We've been given all authority over all the power of the enemy and it says nothing will harm you. So then how does the enemy gain authority over us? We give it back to him. Hear me for a moment. How do we give it back to him? Every time we choose to do just as Eve did. When you choose to follow the flesh or the enemy and his deception instead of following Yahweh's instructions and in Torah, just like Adam and Eve did. The, the, it is in your hands. It's in our hands. You have the power. I know, y'all are hearing that song too. I hear it too, praise the Lord. I got the power. Hey. Now, I find this very interesting because of what happened just a couple of chapters ago in Luke 10, 19. And we're going we're gonna to hit that here in a minute. And I want to hang out there, matter of fact. Because when you, go to, when you go to Luke chapter 10 or you go back a few verses, you're going to find an interesting thing, that, an event that happened in Messiah's, in Messiah's life. I want to say this. When Messiah came, he reversed. This is a great statement. He reversed what Adam and Eve did in the garden. 
But we're shaking our heads. If you don't, just at least go like this, right? Like, I don't, I'm not sure about that. But he did. He reversed it. Everything that Adam and Eve messed up, Jesus comes on the scene, and what does he do? He reversed it. He had to. He had a clean house. Now, to understand this, I want to set kind of a, some, some corporate understanding, which I find very fascinating. First, we need to understand, or we should understand, that as we have mentioned, that Adam and Eve were in the land of perfection. It was a place of provision. It was a place of Yahweh's uh, shalom, his peace, his very presence. So because his presence were there, it was a place of love. How do we know that? Well, we know 1 John tells us that Yahweh is love. So it was, it, was the, it was the perfect place to live and to be. Now, second, we're going to jump out into here, and we're going to talk about something very interesting, because when we see Yeshua doing this reversal, he does the reversal in a place that was fallen, a place called the wilderness. It was under a curse. It was barren, and it was desolate. It was the wilderness. It wasn't like, like we think of the wilderness maybe sometimes today. Well, I guess if you go to, what is it, South Texas, that would be maybe close to the wilderness that maybe he was expecting. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about, right? It wasn't North Idaho, okay, so like, or Canada, like beautiful trees and you know, deer and you know, bouncing around. I don't think it was that way. I think it was just exactly what we see in description of what the word wilderness means. It was desolate. There was no life. Now, before we get into this, 1 John really brings something to light that G Jesus, Messiah, is going to deal with. And in 1 John, he, talking about this world and the, the sin and the lawlessness of the world, he places it basically in three categories. Some of you all know this, right? But in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, we see this. For everything in the world, say everything. All right, so nothing's excluded. Nothing. For everything in the world, the desire of the flesh. So if you're wrestling with a sin or sinfulness, it's going to align into one of these three categories. So it's either coming from the desire of the flesh or it's coming from the desires of your eyes. In other words, you see something and you got to have it. Or probably the one I think that a lot of us struggle with the most and that's this one, the boasting of life. Pride. Some call it the pride of life or the boasting of life. It says, and he goes on, he says, this is not from the Father, but of the world or from the world. So because this world we live in is a fallen world, no question, I don't think anybody in here or online would argue with me. It's a fallen world. Then in the world, anything that comes out of this is going to fall into one of those three categories. Why? Why? Because of what happened in the garden. So let's go back and let's understand the fall so we can understand our redemption. I want to jump right into Genesis chapter 3 so I have time to get through this. Genesis chapter 3. But the serpent was shrewder than any animal of the field that Adonai Elohim or Yahweh Elohim made. So it said to the woman, did God really say? You must not eat from the tree of the garden. Now I know that I've, I've made this statement before. I know that I've made this time and time and time again. But I still know that there are people in this community, particularly because I hear about it, that are still questioning or are questioning Yahweh's word. This is, the, this is the, the first and greatest attack, and it's the, the continual ongoing weapon that our enemy uses. Did God really say? And he constantly puts us in a place, or we allow us to be put into a place of questioning what Yahweh really said. And it's crazy when we think about it, especially when we think about his authority and the authority that's been given. He's shrewd. Let me tell you something. He's been at it a lot longer than you've been at it. Right? I mean, Hasatan or Satan, he, he's not some like idiot that's sitting over there with a dunce cap on. He's got a plan. And some of us have fallen into it. 
Some of us have given into it. Even knowing what Yahweh's word may say, we still fall into it because, yeah, I know this is what he said, but I've said this before. This is why you've got to guard. You've got to put guards up, church. You've got to guard your mouth. You've got to guard your heart. Jump it into verse 2. The woman said to the serpent, after this question was asked, of the fruit of the trees we may eat, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, Elohim said, you must not eat of it, and you must not touch it, or you will die. Question, is that what Yahweh said? Come on, some of you Bible scholars, you know what the word says, right? What did he tell them? What did he tell them? Don't eat it. This is why I be- you need to know Yahweh's word. Now, here's the argument, right? We don't know whether or not, I'm going to switch that back just so that. We don't know whether or not Eve is only getting secondhand information, right? We, and I've heard some people say that we've talked about this, right? Like, where was Adam? Adam's chilling, like, like Adam's in a lawn chair, you know, sick in a margarita or whatever, just watching all this thing happen. We don't know. Right? We don't know what's happening. But we do go, hey, where's Adam? Where is the man that was told by Yahweh? Where's he at? Why is he speaking up? There is a message there. We, we agree. But we don't know facts. We don't know biblically what the, what the whole situation or, or circumstance may have been. But we know that something's wrong with the word, that it did not get translated into at least Eve, where she understood what was being said. Because the commandment was, don't eat of it. Didn't say they couldn't touch it. But that's how the enemy comes in and twists Yahweh's word in everything, in so many situations. And we see this more and more and more in this, especially within our movement. We see a lot of this word being twitched and stretched and formed read differently. And we try to make it sound like, oh, this is okay. Until we go back and say, well, wait a minute, the Bible doesn't say that. That's why you need to know what the word says. Going on into verse 4. The serpent said to the woman, you most assuredly won't die. Now, physically, he was decepting, right? Because physically, they wouldn't have died physically. But that's where the deception came in. There's still death. When we are born in this world, we are spiritually dead because of the curse. This is very important to understand because some people do not understand their salvation. When you repent and you believe in Messiah, what happens? Born again. You're now alive in Christ. Come on, people. You got to get this this morning. I know this, it's not really as deep as we think it is. But it's, it's, it, open your eyes. Why? Your authority. Your authority. The serpent said to the woman, you most assuredly won't die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like Elohim, knowing good and evil. Can we ever really become like Elohim? That's the apple. That's the apple. That's the apple. Or fig or grapes or whatever it was on the tree. So we see this interesting fall that happens. We see this correlation between, okay, when when all of this happened, this happened in the perfect situation, perfect world. Eve, or I'm sorry, uh, Eden uh, was perfect. Yahweh was in the presence. They fellowshiped. They had responsibilities. But something happens. This is why Yeshua comes, now in a cursed world. And he has to reverse what was done. He has to change the outcome. So we see in Genesis 3, 6, let's look at the curse. The curse being the lust of the flesh. It's what the flesh wants. Robbie and I uh, have changed a little bit of the way we're eating. We're trying to change and trying to live a little bit more 
uh, a better healthy life. I want to be around for my, my grandchildren and be able to play with them. And some of y'all know, you know, you kind of like all of a sudden getting shortness of breath and I'm looking at the scale and it's not, it's going one direction. That's the wrong direction. We need to come the other direction, right? And so we've decided to start trying to eat better. And uh, I think it was yesterday, um, I was in the office working and I came out and I just had this, y'all know what I'm talking about, right? Like, don't, don't look at me like I'm a foreign exchange student, but like you get this desire, like you want some of that, that, that dopamine starts kicking in, right? You want that sugar, that candy bar, that chip, that whatever that starts, right? Because your body hasn't had it for a while, so your body starts yearning for that, right? I had that moment yesterday while I'm studying this passage because that's the lust of the flesh. That's that thing you think you can't live without, that you got to have. The flesh lies to you and think, oh, you got to have this. Genesis 3, verse 6. Now the woman saw that the tree was good for food. How many, how many times have we got ourselves into a position or a situation where just by looking at something, it looked good. Right? What did mom and daddy used to say? If it looks too good to be true, it probably is. We look at things and go, well, there's nothing wrong with it. It's not harmful. It looks good. It looks like food. But it's not. It's poison. That can go to a whole nother message, right? But this is where it starts. To take our eyes off of what Yahweh has given them. What Yahweh, think about this for a moment, right? Place yourself in, in the garden. They had everything. And what does the enemy do? Take your eyes off of everything that's been given to you and do what? Point it to this one thing that you can't have. Or, let me get in your business for a moment. Point it to that one thing everybody else has but you. Maybe it's money, maybe it's a lifestyle, maybe it's a family, maybe it's a car, maybe it's whatever. I think the commandment says don't covet. But we look at these things, and that's how the enemy works, isn't he? He shows us these little things like, oh, you can't have this. But we'll go out of our way try to make it happen, won't we? They're in the midst of the garden where every tree was at their disposal except the one. But this is how sin works. This is how lawlessness happens. You take your eyes of what has been given to you and you put them on what you cannot have and make it look good. You try, we try as we try to make something look good when Yahweh says that's not good. But what's the cure? Right here. I don't know how we got to that. We got hit it by accident. Luke 4 3. And the devil said to him, If you are Ben Elohim, tell this stone to become bread. Yeshua answered him, it is written. You all know the scripture, right? Man shall not live by bread alone. Conquering this lust of the flesh. Why is this a lust of the flesh? Well, you got to go back and you go back a couple of verses, just one or two. I actually left it out just for the sake of time. Is that Yeshua is coming off a 40-day fast. The flesh was hungry. And the enemy comes in and he deals with the exact thing that was in need right there at that moment. And that's what he'll do with us. The one thing that's really there, that's why I tell people, man, all you got to do is, is, is like, like when you fast and pray, I think it's beautiful. Because, man, it allows you to really see your heart and what you really desire. See, Hasatan knew. And he attacks him in the flesh with bread. So we get this lust of the flesh. We want what the flesh wants. We're not willing to be disciplined. We're not willing to sacrifice so that we do not go into the direction that Yahweh doesn't want us to go. And then we go into the second one, which is the lust of the eyes. So it's not just what we feel in the flesh that we want. Now it's what we see that the flesh sees and goes, oh, this would make your life so much better. Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. Now the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a thing of lust for the eyes. Now, I know that's not this church. It's the other churches that have that problem, right? Like, we would never do that, really. 
but we do. Remember, everything that we get trapped in is following into these, one of these three categories in the thing that you're wrestling with the most. What's the cure? There we go. The cure. And leading him up, the devil showed him all the kingdoms of the world in an instant. And the devil said to him, I'll give you all this authority. So he sets Yeshua up on a pinnacle to, to look out and everything that you see, Yeshua, I'll give it to you. I am so grateful, come on somebody, that Yahweh has not given me everything that I have put my eyes upon. We would all be in trouble, wouldn't we? Praise the Lord. And the devil said to him, I'll give you all this authority along with its glory because it's been handed over to me and I can give it to anyone that I wish. Therefore, if you, are, if you will worship before me, there's always a cost. There's always a cost, guys. There's always a cost to that little bitty sin that you think won't, won't, won't keep you very long, but it'll keep you longer than you want it to be there. There's always a cost. The anointing, think about that for a moment. Your testimony, your witness. But in the moment, we don't think about that. If you'll worship before me, all that shall be yours. But verse 8, but answering Yeshua told him, it is written, you shall worship Yahweh your God, and him only shall you serve. What a great reminder for all of us that the only, the only requirement is to worship him. Nothing else. Nothing else. This really brings us into, see, it's a breakdown, right? If we can get it into the flesh and then in our eyes, then what happens? Then the biggest one, in my opinion, it is the biggest one that humanity deals with, and it's the curse of the pride of life. Success, money, fame, always chasing the wrong thing. Always desiring more. We're never satisfied. The flesh will never be satisfied. I was talking with someone recently, and most of you will agree with this statement, is that the world has lied to us about happiness. And we hear statements like, you deserve to be happy. We don't deserve happiness. Matter of fact, if you understand happiness versus what the, that's what the world provides. The world provides happiness. It's circumstantial. Always. Happiness will always change based upon your circumstance. What we should be after when we submit to Yeshua as our Lord and our King, and that's the focus, guess what happens? Joy. Joy is what we should be after. And that can only come from inside us, from a transformed life, from a redeemed life. We should desire joy more than happiness. Because your situation will change. It will. It always has. It's never the same. So we go into the last one, which is the pride of life. Looking at the curse, Genesis 3, 6. And that the tree was desirable for imparting wisdom. So she took of its fruit. She took of its fruit and she ate. She also gave to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Again, that's a whole other message. We're not going to tackle that one today. But it was desirable for imparting wisdom. Everybody wants to be that person. It's pride. We want to have all the knowledge. We want to have all the understanding. We want to be that person in the room. I remember telling somebody one time, we were, as we were building, uh, as the Lord was leading us to build this community, they were trying to like, and, and I hear this sometimes, you know, it's like, oh, look at what you've done. I'm like, whoa, 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 time out. I didn't do any of this. Now, yes, Yahweh used my hands and feet, but there are a lot of other people. And I tell people this all the time. I don't want to be the smartest man in the room. I want to know who is. Because that's the person I want to point people to. And we should have that same yearning, not to have all this wisdom. And oh, It's great that you have all this wisdom and all this knowledge of Yahweh, but how does it reflect and how does it come out? Are you prideful? The very fact that she's based upon what the enemy tells us here. This is everything is based upon this. 
It's like the, the FOMO. Y'all know what FOMO is, right? I have a dog that has FOMO. I'm telling, don't we? We have, we have two dogs that have FOMO. Like, if you do anything and that dog is not there in the room, it, that dog gets upset. Like, we, we shut the door for a minute, right? And that dog is on top of our window like, like the other day, yeah, right? Well, the other day, I, I thought it was so crazy because I'm looking at the window after Robin just cleaned, and all it looks like we have a five-year-old in there. We don't have a five-year-old. We have a lab that's about this big, and his nose prints all over my window. Why, FOMO? Some of you in this room have FOMO. I know when Pastor Scott's not here, he has FOMO. He wants to know what's happened, what's going on, where am I? The fear of missing out. That's exactly what's happening here with Eve. Get all this wisdom and get all the knowledge. Know everything so you don't have that FOMO. But we see the cure from the curse in Messiah. And then he brought Yeshua to Jerusalem and placed him on the highest point of the temple. And he said to him, If you are the son of Elohim, Ben Elohim, throw yourself down for here, from here. For it is written... He will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And upon their hands they will lift you up so that you may not strike your foot against a stone. But answering, Yeshua said to him, it is said, you shall not put Yahweh, your Elohim, to the test. Oh God, if you really loved me, you would do this. Instead of learning to be content, As Paul said, I've learned to be content in all things. In all things. We buy into the lie of more, that we're not having enough, that we got to look like everybody else in this world. The problem with it is, if the world has fallen into one of these three categories, which is the curse. And Yeshua broke that. Notice the temptations Messiah that he tempts Messiah with tempting Yahweh, the exact same issue that our enemy has. It's exactly what, what Hasatan did. This is, that's why this is one of the greatest sins, because this is exactly what Hasatan did. I will build my kingdom. Notice what he offers Yeshua. I'll give you the kingdom. I'll give you everything. The very thing. And now what does he want to do? He wants you to fall for it as well. Why? Because his desire, the enemy's move, and this is his only move, is to pervert you. Why? Because there is a kingdom coming. This is where sin and lawlessness really should, should, should scare us, in a, in a sense, in a, in a good reverent uh, scare. Why? Because when you sin, you lose your authority that's been given to you. When you choose to walk away from Torah and Yahweh's word and his instruction, and you feel like your wisdom, your insight is better... You're placing yourself in a place that you lose that authority. Messiah does not move, and he's not moved by any of that, is he? My point is to point in pointing this out this morning is the fact that this is just part of one of part one of Yahweh's plan. And who's going to rule this place? Before he can make all things new in the, in the kingdom, Yeshua destroys the curse that was laid upon us here, and he destroys the final part, which will be the next part that we're going to talk about. He destroys the curse. But do you understand something? Listen to me for a moment. I know you'll hear my heart, and you'll understand why some people are like, well, why is there sickness? Why is there? Because we still live in a broken world. But on you, follower of Messiah, It's been broken. It's been broken from you. This is why we can say all things are new. But the one thing that's not broken yet, that we know that everyone in this room has has been faced with, and maybe even will still face with until the return of Messiah. That's death. That's death. We'll talk about that here in a moment. He also... He was led into the wilderness. He was led to temptation in order to demonstrate to us how we can resist the temptation to sin. 
So it's not just about breaking the flesh. And he shows us that we can, we can defeat the flesh. You have the ability to defeat whatever enemy comes at you, anything. To say that you don't is to say that the work that Messiah did failed. You have it because Yahweh did it. But then he also breaks the wilderness experiences death. He goes into the desolate wilderness for 40 years and he's tempted by the enemy to demonstrate to us how we can resist temptation to lawlessness where Adam and Eve failed. Christ gains the victory. Most believe, and I say most, believe that the sins Yeshua was faced with are these categories of human temptation. I don't know what you're faced with today. And you may not be faced with anything at the moment. That's great. Praise Yahweh. But I'm telling you, the other thing you have to look at then is what is your position? Where do you stand? I want to continue on in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. Look here. But we see one. Remember, he deals with mankind, and then he brings it back. Going to bring it back to Messiah. But we see one who was made for a little while, long, little while lower than the angels. Now, notice this. I love this because what is this, what is this pointing to? What? what is this pointing to? Messiah's what? Human nature. His humanness. Right? I love that. He was made a little while just like you and me. Just like you and me. Though we know he wasn't. But he was made one for a while. Namely Yeshua. He is now crowned with glory and honor because of the death he suffered. Oh. So that by the grace of Elohim, he might taste death for everyone. This is exactly the reversal of what was told in the garden, wasn't it? Oh, if you eat it, you die. Now Yeshua faces death for all of us. He takes on your penalty, your death, your death. All of us deserve to die because of sin. I've asked people this before, and most of you probably know the answer, but I'll say, which of the Ten Commandments have a death sentence? I know some of y'all are going, don't go your pussy right now, right? You're going through your brain, right? Every one of them. Paul said if you break one of the commandments, what? You break all of them. All of them have a death sentence. But Yeshua takes on that death for everyone. He tastes death. So he defeats every temptation in the desolate place. He faces death that you and I are subject to. And that is why the earth is groaning. You know why the earth is groaning? Because you're redeemed and it is not. Come on, somebody. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. You are redeemed. The world is not. We live in a fallen world, yet you now have experienced true redemption found in Messiah Yeshua. Authority has been given to you. That's why the earth waits. Romans 8.22, look here. Romans 8.22, for we know that the whole creation, the whole creation groans together and suffers birth pains until now. And not only creation, but even ourselves. We ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit. Whew. Oh my goodness. Groan inwardly. Do you groan for the return of Messiah? Do you groan to see the day that he will make all things new? He's coming back. And all this crazy that we see in the world, and I know many of you prayed the prayer, when are you coming back? Enough already. We're groaning. But you don't groan alone. We groan together along with the entire creation. The redemption of our body. Oh, that we groan. That we can take our rightful places beside Messiah, the firstborn of many. But we need to remember something that Paul says that just brings this all to light. I love this. We find it in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. Don't you know 
Don't you know, bring us back to the, to the place of the, the main point of today's message. Don't you know that the Kedoshim, the priest, will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to judge trivial matters? Don't you know? Remember we talked about the angels and their position? Look at what the Bible says. You, people, priests and kings, will do what? Kedoshim, you will judge the angels. How much more than matters of this life? Like, this can take us to so many different areas of teaching, can it? Like, why are we bickering amongst one another? Why are we fighting amongst one another? We're going to be judging the angelic beings. We're going to have our position reinstated and the authority of the believer because of Jesus, not because of you. This is why I say it's been perverted. Why has it been perverted? Because some beliefs and some religions believe that now that you have this position, it's kind of a blab it and grab it, name it and claim it type thing, right? I can just say anything and it's going to pop up in my driveway. Drive by somebody's house and go, well, Sonia's house looks nice. I think I'll have her. I want that house, Lord. Sonia may not want you to have that house, praise God, okay? But we do. You know what I'm talking about, this perversion. That's not what it's about. It's our placement because of Messiah and the world to come. I want to go back for just a moment, back because we're talking about this authority. I want to go back one moment, and I, and I kind of I hinted at it a couple of times, but as I get ready to close, I want to bring Hebrews 2.8 back to life because it's really good. If I stay on there, Zachary, too long, just click me off of that. I know I stayed on there too long, and people are going, I can't see him. Hebrews 2.8, look here, it's Hebrews 2.8 says, you put all things in subjection. We've already read this underneath him, underneath his feet. For when he put all things in subjection to him, he left nothing outside of his control. In other words, all control, all authority has been given. But watch this. But for now, this is the part I want us to understand here. This is the scary part. But for now, we do not yet see all things subjected to him. What's not subjected? There's one thing in this life right now that is not subjected to Messiah. Everything else, according to the scripture, has been subjected. What is it? Death. Death. And isn't it interesting that the y- y- Yahweh, or not Yahweh, Hasatan uses this against the body of Christ? Well, if God loved you, why did he die? Why did they die? Because death has not been completely subjected to him yet. Yes, he has defeated death, but until all things come and are completed, we have not, and we will still taste death. Death is not cool. No one likes death. I don't know why, but it still exists, and we still die. But a day is coming, brothers and sisters, when even death will be defeated permanently. Do you understand that? For eternity we will live. In Hebrews 9, we see that, uh, and we're going to cover that later on, and it, it says that it's appointed unto man to die and face judgment. Death is not under our feet yet. But looking at what Apostle Paul says, he says this, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For Elohim has put all things in subjection under his feet. Almost a repetitive of what we just read, right, in Hebrews. This is powerful, church. He is coming again, and when he does, death will be defeated once and for all. But for now, live in your authority. Stop allowing the enemy to lie to you about situations and circumstances of your life and thinking they have dominion over you. They only have dominion over you, number one, if you allow it, or number two, you are in sin. Now, well, what about people that are sick? Not the same thing, guys. They will be made whole one day. 
we do live in a fallen world. And there's a lot of this sometimes we just don't understand or cannot grasp, but the one thing is, Yahweh's put us in charge. You have his word. You have his word. Stand on his word. Stand on the promises. How long? As long as it takes. Stand on his promises. Trust him. How long? Till death is defeated. Till death is defeated. Amen? With that.